I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers. And we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. If the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. What do you think about when you think about God? What do you picture when you picture God? Is it possible that your trouble with God comes from a misunderstanding of who He really is? Even in the chaos, God sits on His throne. Even in the unknown, Jesus reigns above it all. What if you amplified what you know about God and the truth of His Word, having confidence that He is able to hold on to you and to make all things new, to truly know how wide and how long and how high and how deep His love is? No matter what happens, no matter what we face, if you aren't able to find any peace, certainty, or confidence, maybe your God is too small. What do you think about when you think about God? Like what version of God are you actually responding to? What images or force or being or spiritual thing are are you envisioning? I think Kenny did a fantastic job of kicking off this series last week with this important question. What do you think about when you think about God? And what most of us found out is that when we think about God, our version of God is too small. So really, I mean, think about it. This This is a very important question. What do you think about when you think about God, because uh, when it comes to faith, uh, it, it, when, if we get this question wrong right here, we could be responding, reacting, even rejecting a version of God that doesn't exist. I mean, this is a really important question. So when you think about God, how much power does he have? What does he know? Where does he live? Uh, what does God care about the most? Can, can he solve your anxiety? Can he bring you a peace that passes understanding? Can he heal your brokenness? Can he make you sin less? Can he provide for your needs every day in every way? How big is your God? What do you think about when you think about God? What version of God are you responding to? Is it your, your version? Is it a made-up version? Is it a mixture of what your grandma told you and you saw on TV or you read about in a textbook? Or is it the version that God gives of himself in Scripture? See, our intent in in this series is to to blow up our view of God. And and I want people to recognize how all-powerful, all-knowing, and completely perfect God actually is. Give you an expanded version that will leave you with more confidence that God is able to hold us, sustain us, guide us, and deliver us, and transform us from the inside out. That our God has the ability to make all things new. Though no matter what happens, no matter what we face, no matter how dark our weeks are, with God and with this God, the best is yet to come. And if you don't believe that, the version of God that you're responding to is too small. It is. It's too small. Now, if you're gathered here today and you're like, Josh, I'm not sure about how I feel about God. You know, I, you're on the fence. I, you know, I, 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 I get it. Because there seems to be a lot of things that if I were God, I would address so, so I want you to know, I understand from my limited perspective, in my limited understanding, in my limited vantage point, in my low pain tolerance, from the things that just annoy me. If I was God, I'll be transparent. I'd change some things. 
I'd never be stuck behind a slow driver ever. (laughs) I would never accidentally bite the inside of my mouth. There would be no more mosquitoes. My checkout lane would always be the fastest. My wife would always know where she wanted to eat, right? There'd be, there'd be, we'd solve world hunger. We'd heal the vision. IU basketball would be dominant again. The Colts would win the Super Bowl every year. I, I would make common sense more common. And just for fun, I changed things up. The sloth would be the fastest land animal, right? Penguins would be able to fly. And I would never, ever, 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 ever have created cats. Why? Because cats are terrible. And if you're like a cat, a cat person, like, hey, my cat's different. You just need to meet mittens. No, I don't. My pet, pet, ti- my cat, pet cat tiger is really nice. No, 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 no. Like, I, I, you need to know that, that your cat is never going to love you like a therapy dog would, right? Your, your cat's never going to love you. It won't show your loyalty. You can't call it. It doesn't, it won't be bothered by its name. You can be yelling its name around the house. And unless you have food, it won't come. Cats are terrible. They can't do anything. You can't walk it. If you open up the door, it'll run away and never come back. And if you die, Google it, right? If you die and locked in the house with your cat, it will eat you, right? So in what world where you could have a loyal, obedient, loving dog, how messed up would you have to be to go like, cats are better than dogs? Cats are the biggest hoax in the animal kingdom. So I'm not sure, you know, like where you stand with this whole God thing. Because if you were God, you know, if I was God, there's some things, some things I would address in this world. <laughs> I get it. Except for, for most of us, the questions are more serious than that, aren't they? They're, they're like babies dying. Or, or loved ones dying of cancer. Or the tragic accidents that just seem to make no sense. The, they're the terrible things that, that we face that we just don't really have any emotionally satisfying answers for. And so no matter how painful of a life experience that, that we've encountered, here's one of the responses that you and I just can't have. And it's a phrase that I've heard all throughout my ministry. I've heard it in different places, in funeral homes. I've heard it in hospitals. I've heard it in coffee shops. It's this phrase right here is, I won't believe in a God who would. I wouldn't believe in a God who would allow that to happen. I wouldn't be, believe in a God who would allow them to suffer. I wouldn't believe in a God who would allow that to take place. And e- even if you never decide to believe in God, I want you to realize this is a limiting argument. Argument, Because what you're saying is I wouldn't believe in a God who, who thinks like I think, knows what I know, is response to what I respond, would change the things that I would change. So, so if you take this line of reasoning, your God can't be any smarter than you. And your God can't know any more than you. And your God can't have a different perspective on life or humanity or anything else that you don't have. I'll be transparent. If I was God, there's a lot of things I would change. If there's, I was God, there's a lot of rules I wouldn't have. There's a lot of pain I would personally avoid. But, but I, I, if I say that phrase right there, my God's too small. I mean, think about it. If we could completely understand God, he wouldn't be God. So as tough as it is to come to terms with, we should actually want to follow a God that we cannot completely understand. Let's just be transparent. We have a limited perspective. Uh, Let me show you a real life example, right? Uh, I don't know. Put put the picture up here on the screen, right? Yeah, so here we go. Real life example of a boa constrictor. I don't know about you, but snakes give me the heebie-jeebies. I I read something about them that applies to what we're talking about today. In the wild, a boa constrictor, a boa constrictor can grow up to 216 inches. And I measured it in inches because snakes don't have any feet. No? All right. All right. (laughs) But, But a boa constrictor, be careful. Boa constrictor can, just kidding, I'm not going to put a real boa constrictor in here. 216 inches, which is, which is about 18 feet long. That is, I mean, if you see a snake like this in the wild, like it, it's going to, you know, might have to change your pants. And not only do snakes, you know, scare me, they annoy me because they're always throwing a hissy fit, right? No? All right. So, so now here's the thing. There are actually some people out there, and I'll never understand these people, but they actually have boa constrictors as, as pets, right? And, and, and you're like, Josh, they don't bite. I don't care, right? This is, but, but here's what I read, that in the wild, these boa constrictors can grow up to 18 feet long, but in captivity, this is pretty interesting, that in captivity, they'll only grow to about six to eight feet long, which is still a big deal for me, right? That's a deal breaker for me, but it, it only grows up to less than half the size. And boa constrictors actually grow in proportion to, to their container, so a boa constrictor out in the wild, it has no limitations. But when it becomes a pet, its growth is stunted based on the size of the aquarium that it's put in. To which you might say, Josh, what does this have to do with, with God? Well, just like the, the boa constrictor, many of us have a limited experience with God. He knows what we know. 
He feels what we feel. And many of us are responding to a version of God that we were taught, that we feel comfortable with, and we limit our experience with God. Uh, we limit it to like an hour on Sunday or, or half hour in a group. And we, like, like the boat constrictor, we, we take this idea of God and we put it in a box. And in doing so, we have a limited version of God. We have a limited understanding of God. We have a limited experience with God. And we're shrinking our God up to this version and putting God in this box. And that's why so many people say they follow Jesus. Uh, they believe in God, but they won't talk about him. They believe in God, but they won't sacrifice for him. They believe in God, but they won't trust him to heal, fix, or forgive the stuff in their life. They believe in God, but they won't give to him. They believe in God, but they won't do what he says. When you look at their life, there is no life change. And they do that because they're responding to a God that's just too small. And many of us, we carry around our own version of God who, get this, who's not real. Because like most of the things, uh, we like most of the things about God, but we don't like everything about God. And we like the part about the grace, but we don't like the obey stuff so much. So we create our own version of God and we leave stuff out. And our default answer to any judgy Christian who wants to say, you know, call us out on our stuff says, I don't think my God would keep me from that. Why? Because my God wants me to be happy, right? You see, when you have a limited view of God, we create our own version of God. It's like the Burger King version of God. You can have it your way. And so we'll order up all of these things to throw in the box, right? We have God who has, uh, and we'll have a supersized order of God who has all the power to make my life easier. We're going to have extra grace so he can forgive all the sins that I commit on purpose. We're going to hold the truth because I don't want to follow some of the stuff. And we're going to have a huge side of don't make me feel guilty for anything. And if you have that version of God, your God's too small. Because with that version of God, you'll be riding along this road called life, listening to Stairway to Heaven, when all of a sudden your life hits a wall. It'll be in your marriage or your finances or your health or your job. And it just feels like the, your life is falling apart. And you'll turn to this God saying, hey, wake up, fix something, do something, get me out of this, right? And this God, at least the version of God that we created, he looks at you and he says, I can't. <laughs> and you know why? Because he's not real. He's just a version of God that we created. He doesn't have any power. He's just something we made up. We shrunk God down and what we think about, what we think about God, and we shoved him into this little box. And as a result, the people who who have God's favor, the very people who have God's love and have access to to, to contentment, who have access to peace, they can be confident, world-changing sons and daughters of the king. They don't live as if their perfect heavenly father, who can change the hearts and minds of men, is transforming their lives from the inside out to look more and more like him. Why? That doesn't happen because their God's too small. And in reality, we're not boxing God in. We're actually boxing ourselves out. We're boxing ourselves out because in reality, we don't have the power to actually shove the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, holy God in a box. Like we're not strong enough. And so so here's the challenge. If if God isn't living up to our expectations, maybe it's time to change our expectations of him. Because God is not like anyone you've ever met. God is outside of time. He stands outside of creation. He has no limits. He's like someone you've never met. In fact, the only limit that God actually has in your life is, is our ability to process how big he is. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, he tries to give us some insight to talk about the magnitude of God. He writes this. He says, see the sovereign Lord. He comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. Who, who, who has the uh, measure the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on scales and the hills in a balance? I'm telling you, we don't have the power to show that God in a box. And so... If, if you say, I don't believe in a God who would, doesn't think like you think, doesn't know what you know, respond how do you would respond, uh, you know, change what you would change. If you don't believe in a God that you can negotiate with, a God that you can change, a God that you can manipulate, you need to know that that's not the God of the universe, and it's not the God that we see in the Bible. In fact, I want you to hear me very clearly. I don't believe in that God either. I don't believe in that God either. So what do you think about when you think about God? Because I, because I don't believe in that God either. That God's too small. Is, is it possible that maybe you were responding 
to a made-up version of God, trying to put that gut version of God in a box. Like, but the all-powerful, all-knowing God, always present God is real, and he's ready to have a relationship with you. But because you and I are reacting and responding and maybe even rejecting to a, ver- a version of God uh, that, that isn't real, so many, so many of us have missed that. And the reality is, is we're not boxing God in. We're boxing ourselves out from ever tru- truly experiencing the living God. And if you've ever done that, I, you're in good company. I, I can say, me too. But there are days when what I experience causes me to limit God. There are days when then what I struggle with causes me to limit God. And if you've ever done that, you're not alone. Like, in fact, when we pick up and read the Bible, you have to understand that they're not Bible people. They're, they're people people. People like you and people like me. People who have families and hopes and dreams and expectations. People who encountered extreme tragedy. And, and they would raise their hand and they'd say, hey, you struggle with that? Me too. If you have your Bible or mobile device, please turn to Job 38. And as you're getting there, I just want to catch you up on Job's life. Uh, Job uh, has a huge family. He was highly regarded. He was very wealthy. He was well-respected. He was a godly man. But by the time of Job 38, Job had lost his wealth. He had lost his family. He had lost his health. Even his friends turned on him. And things had gotten so bad for Job. But by chapter (laughs) 2, not 38, by chapter 2, his wife tells him simply this, curse God and die. Now, ladies, I know some of you are thinking, that's a new favorite Bible verse, right? right? Many of you have experienced the quarantine quarrels with your man. I, so I'm just going to quote some scripture to him tonight as he sleeps, right? I, that, that's not a good Bible verse. I just, but I know it's in the Bible. Why? Because these are real people struggling with real things. And Job was reeling. And all throughout those 38 chapters, Job lists the terrible things from his perspective that God has done to him. He says God must be worn out from ruining his life. That the people in town are judging him. His body is reduced to skin and bone. He looks so bad that people are staring at him and, and, and they're call, talking about his sins and they're gasping at the very sight of him. Even his friends are ganging up against him. He has sores all over his body. His eyes are red from crying. His spirit is broken and he longs to just die. In the midst of it all, he wonders some of the same things that I begin to wonder when I face difficulty. What could I have possibly done to deserve this? He claims that he was a good man. So why is God letting him suffer? He's asked some of the same questions that maybe you've asked before. God, why did you let this happen? I mean, I'm I'm generally a good person, at least better than the people around me. I'm way more moral, way more moral, way more kind. And they seem to be getting everything that they want. And Job is speaking out of deep grief, but he's not rejecting God. He's just expressing his feelings. God, you could have done something. God, you could have stepped in. Here's how Job says it. He says, I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. And in Job 38, God finally speaks to Job. It says this. It says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Now, when God speaks to Job, the the word Lord in your Bible, it's in all caps. It's not a typo. Anytime you see the word Lord that way, that means God's biggest, highest name. The name that he wants to be known by, the way that he wants you to see him, greater than anything and everything else. The the, the God described in the scriptures, he isn't your little buddy. He isn't your God luck charm. He's not being able to shove in a box. No, he's a sovereign God. See, whenever you see the word Lord like that, you need to think God Almighty, sovereign Lord, supreme being, ruler over everything, God most high, ruler and commander of all things, all powerful, unstoppable, all knowing, almighty king of the universe. And whenever you see that name Lord, that's what that means. It says, then the Lord Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And so God is going to responding to Job in the storm. Lightning's, you know, crashing, thunder's clapping. And Job is bracing himself because in this moment, he's thinking about what his friends had told him about this God. He's bracing himself for this version of God that his friends told him about because his friends would say things like this, Job, I know why this is happening to you. It's because of your wickedness, that there's no limit to your sins. You deserve this. In fact, another friend said this. He punishes the wicked for their wickedness out in the open where everyone can see it because they quit following him. Job, it's your fault. God is paying you back. But in Job 38, out of the storm, God uses his personal name, Yahweh, Jehovah. And right out of the gate, God is personal with Job. He speaks to Job directly but intimately. And when God first starts speaking to Job, he does something to Job that I think he would do to us. When God first starts speaking to Job, God doesn't address Job's problems. 
He doesn't answer any of Job's questions, right? God starts off with who he is. And this is important because the most important thing that you, what you think about is what you think about when you think about God. Everything else is secondary. So God establishes himself as the creator, the commander of everything. He initiates and sustains and fulfills everything in accordance with his plan. And he makes it clear that he directs his attention to, to, to everything in the life, not just the things that we would deem as important. He, in, in Job 38, he details that he's ordained the food chain, the animal kingdom. He talks about the lion and he, how he's commanded him. The raven is fed by him. He tells him that he commands where the birds have their nest. And I love this because God is sarcastic. God, God, God is being sarcastic in this. Uh, so next time you're sarcastic, he's like, I'm just more like God, right? But he begins his, with all of these questions and he asks them of Job. He says this, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked up its dimensions? Surely you know. You, have you ever given orders to the morning or showed the dawn its place? Surely you know, for you are already born. You've lived so many years, right? And what's, what's so interesting is God wasn't calling Job old. He was calling Job out for not being eternal. Almost like, listen, hey, you remember when I was forming everything? You were there, weren't you? Oh, that's right. I hadn't made you yet. You're my creation. You might say, Josh, why is God being mean? No, he's rightfully putting Job in his place. He's calling Job out because Job was viewing God through the lens of his own circumstances. Job was viewing God through the lens of his own pain. So God is rightfully calling Job out because he's God. Now think about it this way. If God lifts up anything above himself, then he can't be good. If God's concerned about anything more than himself, he can't be good because God is valuing something other than the most valuable thing. If you have a problem with that, maybe your God's too small. I so badly want you to have a galactic view of God that changes who you are and how you respond to the world around you. He is unsearchable. He is unknowable. The, Lord, the name of the Lord is, is almighty. His name is power, and it brings power. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He stands before time. He stands outside of time. He's the creator and the sustainer of all life. His voice commands light into existence. He hangs galaxies in place, he, and he can hold the whole ocean in the palm of his hands. He, he is miraculous, immeasurable, immovable, unstoppable. He is beyond description. He's beyond words. His name is above every other name. He reigns supreme every day. He is glorious and he is victorious. He is all-knowing and all-powerful and he's established a kingdom that will last forever. His glory stretches across the universe and not only know that, he knows your name and he knows the number of hair on your head at this moment right now. I'm telling you, a right understanding of God can bring you boldness and hope and clarity and light to every living person. God inv invented Job, the one who was questioning him. So Job gets put back in his place. But do you know what he doesn't get? He doesn't get God's anger. He doesn't have God strike him dead. God doesn't pay him back. Instead, God patiently reminds Job of who he is. And God draws near to Job just like he wants to draw near to you in your pain. And in this difficulty, he changes Job's perspective, teaching him to focus not on his pain, but who God is. So for us, we can question God. He's not threatened by our questions, but he doesn't report to you either. He's not required to give you satisfying answers to your questions. Why? Because he's God. So you can ask your questions, but ask with humility and keep your faith with reverence. See, God did not owe Job this conversation. So when you and I face difficulty of the unknown or tragedy, we can have a lot of questions. We may have experienced a lot of pain, but remember who made you. Remember the power of the one who made you and remember the power of the one who loves you. God drew near to Job, even when he was being questioned. He is his creator, his sustainer, his father. And only God is big enough and strong enough and smart enough to heal men and restore and transform all the parts of our life. And in chapter 42, Job responds to God. This is how he responds. Then Job replied with the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak, and I will question you, and you shall answer me, and my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. 
And that idea of repent simply means rethinking your approach to God. And repentance is all throughout the Bible. In fact, it was Jesus' number one message. He would tell people, if what I'm about to tell you is true, and it is, by the way, because I'm Jesus, you need to repent, meaning you need to rethink all the parts of your life right? So, so you should repent your approach to God, your approach to morality, your approach to your finances. You should repent, repent of everything and, and put God above everything else. And for so many of us, we think that we can get away with disobeying God. We think that we can follow God who winks at our sin. And when life hits us in the face, we run to a God that's too small. It's time for many of us to just repent. So here, here's the challenge. Even if you're not sure you believe in God, I think you should repent. I mean, evaluate what version of God you're responding to. And so for the challenges for all of us today, it's simply this. Look up. Look up. And really consider who God is and what God's done and that God's not done with you. Look up at the breath, even the breath of God who commands galaxies into existence. Look up at the God who gives life to every living and breathing thing. Look up and read scripture about how big God is and how, and be wowed just like Job was. Look up. And if you can't find any peace and if you can't find any certainty or any confidence, maybe you're not looking good enough. Maybe just maybe your God's too small. You can look up and look in. Does the true version of God change your life? You can look up and look in. Like, what do you think about, actually, when you think about God? If your God's job description reads, like, make my life more comfortable and convenient, then your God's too small. If your God says things to you like you don't have to risk it, you should just play it safe, your God's too small. If your God's job is to obey you and do whatever you want, if your God's a genie that only exists to grant your wishes, then your God's too small. If your God has to operate on your timeline, checking things off when you would have them done, then maybe your God's too small. If your God's a white guy with a closet full of suits and ties, or if he loves Americans more than he loves Iranians, if your God's always saying come, but never saying go, your God's too small. If your God never wrecks your schedule or messes up your plans, if your God never asks you to do something that doesn't stretch your budget, if your God needs a certain president to be in office to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, then maybe your God's too small. If your God has never filled your eyes with tears because of his grace or taken away your breath because of his power, your God is too small. If your God's dream for you is to retire and spend a couple decades taking it easy, then your God's too small. If your God always agrees with you and always has the same opinions that you do and has the same preferences that you do, then then maybe your God's too small. If your God always likes what you like and always hates what you hate, your God's too small. If your God is a Baptist or a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Catholic or whatever, your God's too small. If your God is just fine with you only spending an hour with him every week in church or online, if that's just okay with him, your God's too small. If your God says, you've worked hard enough on your marriage, now I just want you to be happy, your God's too small. If God looks at your sin or your greed or your lust or your gossip and says, that's no big deal, I've created way worse people than you, your God's too small. If your God says your marriage is too messed up or your family's too fractured, if your God says you're too young or you're too old or you're too broken or you're too poor or it's too late or you're too guilty, your God's too small. If your God fits nicely into this box, then your God's too small. In fact, there's no God at all because you open it up and find out that God's not in there because God doesn't do boxes. I think it's time to do what Job did. He looked up. He looked in. He looked up. He looked in and he repented. Well, what if we like rethought our approach to life and God and everything else, knowing that the infinite, omnipresent, uh, omniscient, um, holy God, loving, merciful, grace-filled, patient, wise, faithful God of the universe, he was in charge. He wanted you to call him Father. I'm telling you, a right concept of God makes you bold. A right concept of God gives you hope and empowers you and I to obey. So no matter how dark it is, no matter how painful it is, we can be world-changing sons and daughters of the King who has a perfect, powerful, loving, heavenly Father. Look up and look in. Look up and look in. Look up and look in and repent. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you that we can have a right understanding of you. 
And so much of, of your care and concern for us come through the person of Jesus, where you sent him, you spent the life of your son for us, showing us the extent that you would go to, knowing how big you are and, and how, how powerful you are. Father, may that give us boldness and hope and peace. And Father, as we take steps towards you, as we look up at you and look in at ourselves this week, Father, I pray that as we take steps towards you, that you would draw near us and we would find a peace that passes understanding, no matter how far we feel away from you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you have more confidence this week. Uh, and maybe you want to begin a conversation about God. Maybe you've been responding to a different version of God. We all have a next step. If you're ready for yours in person, the next step is out the door and to the left. Online, we have this number that you could text, 317-576-2288, where you could text that and respond. We'd love to begin a conversation with you. And I just want you to remember here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. And we have good news. We do. The world is desperate for hope right now. May we take this good news with us. May we let them know how big and how powerful and how caring our God actually is. Hope you have a great week.